Okay, everyone. Well, thank you so much for joining us here today at Wellwright. And uh, we're going to be talking about a really, really fun topic. We've called it the Desk Jockey's Guide to Fitness. Um, before we get started, I just want to do a few housekeeping points. Um, if you experience any audio problems, you can try to sign on and sign back in. Or if you're using the speakers from your computer, you can always try to dial in. Uh, one other thing, as a reminder, you will be muted through the duration of the call. So uh, type your questions in at, at the bottom. We really encourage you to do that. And you can uh, type your question in at any time during the presentation. Uh, we really, really like that. So without further ado, I just want to uh, introduce a awesome, awesome guest today, personal trainer extraordinaire, Mr. Pete Brown. Thanks and for having me. Yeah, Pete, we we are so happy to have you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and give the floor to you and let you uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, yeah. Um, so basically, a little bit about me. I, I uh, got my undergrad um, from North Central College in Naperville, Illinois, and um, started off with a degree in psychology, and I was uh, playing sports there, and so I had some really good uh, guidance counselors, and they knew that I was really interested in uh, fitness and training for sports, and so uh, they kind of pushed me towards uh, an exercise science degree, and so I pursued that, fell in love with uh, doing that, and uh, after completing an internship, have basically been a, a personal trainer ever since, um, and, and sort of passionately seeking more and better information and, and um, you know, different certifications and things like that, so um, it sort of uh, lit a fire that, that has become a passion, and I know I'll be studying this field, this stuff, for the rest of my life. And I, I wanted to say on top of that, Pete, because I, I don't think you totally did yourself justice there. Pete has some of the most difficult certifications to get in the entire industry that takes cadaver anatomy and neuroscience, and he is a 1% of trainers in the country know what Pete knows. So we are so honored to have him here today. And, uh, well, Pete, let's dig in. Sounds good. Thank you. So the one thing we really wanted to talk about, it's, it's sort of our umbrella topic, is a lot of us are desk workers, and we want to start an exercise program, and we're not really sure where to begin. And so the first question that I wanted to ask you, Pete, is, is what's the best exercise for a sedentary office worker? It's a, it's a great question, um, and, and it's one that, 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 that frequently gets talked about today. I mean, you can probably pick up any uh, runner's world or men's health or any sort of fitness type magazine. This is a, this is a primary question, um, you know, what to do. And so I'll, I'll kind of try and address it as if um, a client kind of walked in and said, all right, here, here's, here's what I do for a living. What should I, what should I sort of do and uh, go about it that way? And, and my first question always ends up being like, you know, what are – what are your goals? Because I think that the industry likes to to say that there's an actual answer for that. Like here's the um, protocol response, and the reality is is that we have to we have to have some question ans answered before we respond to that. And, and so I'll share a couple stories with you. Um, goals need to need to sort of be um, you see that both when they're realistic, and, and what I mean by that is you're you're let's say a sedentary office worker, but that's that's also your job, so you're doing that, you know, however many hours a week. Um, and, and we like to pretend that, you know, we'll have all this free time for exercise. So um, time has to be a big part of that. And, and there's some kind of fun stories that I'll share. I had a, a buddy of mine uh, that came to see me for some advice on training. And, um, you know, he's 60 years old, and, and so he brings in a picture, and, and it's uh, of Lance Armstrong. He says to me, um, Okay, so I want to I want to be Lance Armstrong. I, I'm uh, basically I sit at my desk all day. I, I do this you know job, and and this is what I want to look like. And by the way, I want to do that without uh, um, giving up my six pack of beer every night. And um, I want to do it meeting with you once a week. <laughs> and so you, the goal, absolutely first and foremost, must be realistic. And he was kind of joking, but kind of serious, um, because we can have this sort of best exercise discussion, but if you don't have time to dedicate towards working out, we're not sure exactly where to start with you. Um, the other part of that being realistic is these magazines, for example, will say, okay, so here is, um, let's use Lance Armstrong again, 
here's Lance Armstrong and here's his his workout. This is what he does. And what we like to do is go, okay, so this is this is what Lance Armstrong does and this is who I want to be. And by the way, Lance Armstrong can be, you know, any NFL player, hockey player, professional model, whatever it is that, that this person would like to achieve. And and we start with what they're doing. And we never consider that re the realistic part of that is um, a prerequisite to doing what Lance Armstrong is doing is being Lance Armstrong or being whatever professional model or athlete or whoever we're sort of looking to be. And um, the reality is we sort of need to take a look at what they are and take a step back and go, okay, but I'm not them. So um, what do I need to do now today to start to work towards my goal, um, which is a really big um, sort of, I think, uh, reality check kind of question and, and here's a exercise example that everyone's heard of a squat for the most part I'm gonna assume and so let's say Lance Armstrong's exercise includes squats and so uh, the answer to the question what is the best exercise for sedentary office worker well okay, everyone's gonna say well we should do something like a squat it's a body weight exercise and I almost want people to step back for a second and go well what are the prerequisites for being able to squat what do I need from you know my ankle my knee my hip and sort of um, that leads us to, to sort of the next bullet point is, you know, the best exercise for for you for today because of your job, because whatever it is that you do, your body, your prerequisites may look nothing like your end goal. So let's say that squat, for example, you would like to be able to squat um, to get to where your goal is, but we may step back and go, okay, so you're sitting all day. Um, how are your uh, quote unquote hip extenders uh, working? So your glutes, your your hamstrings, your adductors, th those pieces, how are they functioning? And maybe they need some work before we get to squats. So the tough answer to this question is um, the best exercise may look nothing like your end goal and it, and it may um, be completely different for each individual office worker. Um, based on their goals and where they're at. And, and so that's a really tough question to answer that, that requires, I think, us to, to step back for a second and analyze a, a few pieces of that puzzle and then ultimately start to, to put that um, answer together piece by piece, if that, if that sort of makes sense. Do you, and, do you, and let me, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, sorry. Well, you know, I was wondering, do you think this is one of the disconnects where people read a magazine and they find um, this sort of static workout that their, mm -hmm. you know, their athlete or or model does, and and they're not taking into account where they currently are right now, and then what it takes for them to be that model or that superstar. Right. Yeah. And that goes back to both. You know, look. You know, Lance Armstrong may have just incredibly. Uh, well-functioning knees and, and this desk worker may not and so you don't get to do the things that he does and on top of that you know the re the reality is that um, your job needs to pay your bills and do everything that you need you know the job for and you can't dedicate X number of hours a week to both um, this athletes workout and then oh yeah they get massages and all, all sorts of things that support their body while they're doing that so we have to be realistic with that and you know, the other piece that you kind of reminded me of of this is also I didn't include in the bullet points, but um, you know, this this question of best exercise. If we step back even for a second and go, well, that's a moving target. That's a real time question. What I mean by that is, it's relative. Best is relative to where you are right now. So what's best for you today? If we consider the idea that the whole purpose of exercise is to stimulate your body to adapt, that best exercise is going to be different a week from now, and two weeks from now, and three weeks from now, and there's there's no book, there's no protocol, there's no answer for that that can be given out to everybody. You know, how you adapt to exercise is going to be dramatically different than how somebody else adapts to exercise, and it sort of has to be assessed um, as you're doing it. And, you know, everyone's had a bad week where you have to scale things up or back or, you know, change to accommodate for how your body's feeling. Man, that's, a, that's an awesome answer. And I, I think one that uh, people need to be honest, including myself sometimes. You know, I'm an office worker too, so I, I absolutely get that. Well, then, I think that brings us to an, another really good question. And are there any exercises most office workers should avoid? Um, I think that's the other tail, uh, the other side of that coin. 
Yeah, and, and so I, I can tell you there's a couple of answers for this one. And, and um, when when I got out of college and um, started really digging into um, you know sort of the the quote unquote physical therapy text, and I tried to um, get more information, better answers. Um, there was a lot of a lot of uh, information about. So, so let's say somebody's sitting. We have what uh, is typically called the upper and lower cross syndromes. I think that were originated through uh, a very bright physical therapist by the name of I think Vladimir Yanda. And so um, the idea was that because you're seated, um, things like your quote unquote hip flexors and, and these are various muscles. I mean, we like to blame, I'm sure everyone's heard of the psoas, as if it's the only hip flexors, but, but really there's a lot of different hip flexors depending upon um, where you are in a range of motion. There's more than just the psoas, but these muscles that, that are um, in a shortened position while you're seated um, are the ones that you should uh, address by lengthening and stretching. They're the ones that get tight. Um, and, and similarly, that would be the lower cross, so the, the hip flexors get tight and uh, the up, opposite side of the axis, like the, the hip extenders, the glutes, and those those sort of muscle groups, they get they get weak because you know you're sitting on them. And similarly, um, what's typically said, and even said to this day, um, and, and partially because there may be some truth to it, that the upper cross part of that is that the pecs are tight and the middle of your back, those muscles are weak. Um, again, based on the length that they would be sitting at um, while you're seated. And so I did um, follow these sort of posture-driven, this person sits, these protocols of um, because of this, then you do these things. And what was interesting is I, I wasn't really getting the, the results that I wanted um, from clients. And so here's one example of that. Like somebody has sort of the rounded shoulders, and, and the, again, the classic is the, the, the pecs are tight and the, the back is weak, so we have to do a bunch of rows and let's avoid you know, too much chest work, and what I was sort of wondering is, you know, we could do rows all day long, and it still didn't fix anyone's posture, it still didn't fix that whole desk worker look, and then I started to buy, and again, I should I should have mentioned this at the beginning, if I, if, I'm going to be pretty modest here, if I say something that sounds um, like it might make sense, you know, it, it's not because I had, you know, I'm, I'm a genius or I had an epiphany, um, a lot of this stuff I've been cued into through the various, um, educational programs um, that I've sort of been fortunate enough to be plugged into. And one of those programs um, sort of talked a lot about physics and understanding um, things by looking at the mechanics. And so they would they would sort of essentially a few years back open my eyes to the idea, well, what you're seeing, um, their posture is not an indication of what might be going on inside. And that's, I think, the important thing with exercises to avoid is as far as what the industry typically tells us with desk workers is when you look at somebody seated, what position there and doesn't tell you what's actually going on the inside. So we have to at some level look at what is the stimulus? What would the resistance be? So for example, in a seated position, although my hip flexors may be in a shortened position, they're under no challenge. They're under no load. They're just shorter. And so the old joke was, okay, so if the desk worker has such tight hip flexors, how come they don't stand up and have their elbow bent to 90 degrees from using their computer as well. Why aren't those muscles also tight? And um, so I, I sort of started looking at the resistance, the mechanics of things, and going, oh, wait a second, maybe their shoulders are rounded because um, these back muscles have to work all day actually to support the weight of not only their head, there's, there's a significant challenge there. Maybe they're just tired. So yes, we can train them, but that's, let's not avoid the muscles in the front. And so <laughs> The reality is, is that when I started to flip and go, hold on a second, maybe the hip flexors aren't necessarily um, tight and need to be stretched. What if they're really not being used because they have no challenge while you're seated? Maybe they're incredibly weak. And so I started to, and, and there's many people in the industry who are now coming out and saying this stuff, is, well, hold on a second, we're looking at a posture um, which is a static picture in time, and we're assuming certain things from muscles. Maybe we should go check. And what I started finding was the muscle groups that I had learned were going to be so tight um, were actually quite weak. You know, somebody couldn't hold the weight of their own leg, which is a significant challenge for some people. Um, and so I sort of flipped the whole 
okay, so we shouldn't do seated stuff. We shouldn't do crunches. We have to focus on um, stretching hip flexors and strengthening glutes. And I started going, look, what does a hip have available? And let's just try and make that stronger on both sides, hip flexors, hip extenders, um, you know, left and right side. What what does it have? Let's get it stronger and see what happens. And that was the big sort of turning point. So I don't think there are any exercises to avoid. There's just a, a different approach to, look, this is the human body. Let's take it and make it better at being a human body. So let's strengthen everything around that joint and see what happens. So, so I, I want to um, I want to ask you this because I know there's going to be a lot of people on the call who, who you know we're, we're talking about hip flexors and, and glutes and, and and some mechanics. Um, yes. For the people who they're not even sure what a hip flexor is um, at, at the highest level, um, mm -hmm. you know, for someone to locate their hip flexor on their body or locate their glutes in their body, could you just give them? kind of a 30 second snapshot of what you're referring to? Yeah, yeah, so um, basically the hip flexors would be a group that um, uh, if you were seated, right, and you, and you started to lift your leg up out of the chair, the front of the thigh, um, you know, uh, right below the abdomen there, though, that would be a central group. So it's, they're attached to the leg and then some of them are attached at various points on, on the pelvis and also on the uh, lumbar spine, but they're basically going to be in front. Um, and and you know, if you were to just put your hand on your thigh and move it up towards your hip, that general area right there is going to be a, a chunk of the hip flexors. And then the glutes are basically, we're talking about your butt. You're seated there um, and, and both off to the side of the hip, but then also you're, you, when you're seated, you're, you're seated on your butt, those muscles. And, and that and makes sense. Yeah, yeah, totally. And and I think for the people that are listening to as a as a general recap in case you tuned in later, you know, what Pete was referring to and and Pete, um, excuse me because I'm gonna be really elementary here. Um yeah, yeah, cool. what he was referring to is for quite a while in the in the training and physical therapy industry, um, they would look at someone's job and they would look at their posture that they were in ninety percent of the day. So say an office worker sitting ninety percent of the day and the muscles that look like they were being activated or used throughout the day were thought to be overused and the muscles that um, accompanied those muscles weren't being used so in the case of sitting all day they would say the hip flexors are being used all day long because you're sitting and your legs are coming up towards your abdomen whereas your glutes aren't being used so those are getting weak and what Pete's saying is that may not be true. What what may be true is you're you're actually not using them very much at all, and you really sort of don't know what's weak and what's being used in the body, um, and you have to really take it on a case by case basis. And for people who are sitting in a desk all day, they may what you think they they're overtraining by sitting all day. Really, their legs are so weak. They really need to start there too. So yeah, um, I know I oversimplified that, Pete. Um, no, that's great. That's great. Want to give people a little bit of a, a snapshot of what you, what you're talking about. Um, so, with that being said, is there anything that people can do at their desk to improve their body? Yeah, and this is this is another great question. And, and there's a lot of I always chuckle. I mean, everyone's been on the airplane and they pull out that you know, I think they discontinued Sky Mall, but it's a great it's a great magazine. Totally killed time. And there's always some device, right? Somebody's making some pretty good money off, off of ideas um, like this where, you know, there's this bicycle that fits under your desk and you should bike while you're at work. And, you know, those things are, you know, viable options. I mean, if you stuck to it, it would be okay. And the, my first comment on there is, is to move. You know, I think it's tough. I get it. So my, my wife needs to be at her desk. She's She does video production stuff. She, she's editing a video and she has to be there for quite a while. But if you could even just set like a little clock that goes off at 15 minutes and just reminds you to just even stand up in your desk, move around, just get out of that position, you know, get the blood flowing, all that sort of thing. So anytime you have an opportunity to move around, fidget, do something like that, that, that will help at your desk. Um, you know, and, and I think the big component of this that, that um, 
what we're really looking to answer in this question is, is how can I sort of start hedging my bets to looking the way that I want to look? And some of that is related to being seated at the desk and get up and moving and doing some exercise stuff. But a big thing is, I think the issue with a lot of the clients I've seen with, with sitting at their desk is the dietary stuff. The, you know, I'm working at my desk and I'm also snacking or I'm working so much that I'm not, uh, you know, my only option is to go grab a, a cheeseburger or something like that. And not that cheeseburgers are bad, but, you know, it, the, the dietary part of this, I think, is probably one of the bigger pieces of the puzzle for a lot of people. If, um, so it's in, this, it's in this part of the slide because before you sort of chose to do something at your desk that was exercise related other than just getting up and moving around, I would put the, put the sort of attention on can we remove any of the things that might be contributing negatively to the way you look and feel now? And I think, although, and I'll be the first to tell you, uh, I'm no expert in nutrition and dietary stuff. I, I spent about two years really trying to, to research that area of it, and it was great. It was fun, and it gave me just enough insight to know that I shouldn't be the one to give people recommendations. But I think in general, we all kind of know some of what... <laughs> Not necessarily good foods, bad foods, but total quantity of food. Like, if you're sitting there at your desk mindlessly bunching on stuff, it's probably one of those one of those things that we might look to alter um, first. And you know, that, and that's one of those. If I could just take a second and sidetrack everything here, um, I think it's an interesting point to make is that there's some fields out there where we we sort of have experts in the field, and then um, I think we like to think that the exercise field is one of those. I mean, I, I really pick up magazines all the time and sort of chuckle because it says so-and-so exercise uh, expert. And if we pause and thought about that, there are so many sciences that are involved in the field of exercise, like nutrition and dietary stuff is one of them. Um, you could you could spend a field on physics and mechanics, anatomy, um, kinesiology. Um, and, and then you talk about the nervous system and the, and the brain and even pain, which is now being a science all of its own. Um, it would take somebody a lifetime to study each one of those pieces to be an expert. So I, that's why I just briefly mentioned dietary guidelines, stuff like that. I would leave that for a different expert. I'm not an expert in that field. You know, I've been pretty pretty blessed to be able to to pick up on some of the mechanics and physics stuff, um, you know, and some of the anatomy. But um, I would look to remove a negative. Um, so really looking at trying to see what the nutrition intake is in terms of quantity and in terms of quality in some respects and, and alter that before I would worry too much about trying to be um, too active at the desk. And then the final thing is, and I think this ties in, is this idea of motivation versus commitment. And, you know, at the gym I work at, I, I've been there, I said, for 10 years now, and, you know, the first week in January, you get to see the motivated people come in in the second week some are still there in the third week some are still there that New Year's resolution crowd is very very motivated to work out um, you know but by February March they're not so much there anymore um, and I think the issue is don't spend so much time focusing it you know maybe it's a good habit to get up and move your desk every 15 20 30 minutes I think your best shot at doing this is leaving the motivation behind and making the commitment to two nights a week, three nights a week, three mornings a week, two mornings a week, whatever it is, make the commitment to go to um, either a gym or wherever it is, your favorite place, maybe it's a, a yoga studio, you know, whatever it is, make the commitment to go do 20, 30, 40, an hour, whatever it is of exercise, and don't necessarily put it as, a, as a, I have to do it at my desk. Make the commitment to change your life to do those things. Don't wait for motivation. Because the issue with motivation is, and I tease my, my students about this at the college, I, I, I say, look, you know, when my, my two-year-old son wakes up in the middle of the night, you know, and screaming and crying, I don't have the motivation to go get him out of bed, change his diaper, do all that stuff. It's commitment that does that. It's, it's knowing that it's my responsibility, my job. So if there's a shift in people's um, thinking of, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to do some little stuff at the desk, but my number one goal is to be committed to exercise and taking care of my body. And I'm going to do that twice a week. It doesn't have to be the same two days a week, but no matter what, that's my commitment to do. That's, that's sort of the angle I would take with, with 
answering that question. So I just want to recap this point um, for anyone who tuned in now. You know, you you personally feel, Pete, that if someone has a high level of motivation right now and they're ready to commit to something and they've got the choice where they can either put a lot of effort in changing their work environment, uh, whether it be walking to the water cooler more, standing at a desk, or they could take that commitment energy and put it into the gym two or three days a week. Really the best bang for their buck is, is to take part in a fitness regimen and yes. they'll probably get to their fitness goals really quickly because I think we've all seen in a lot of wellness publications and health publications um, sort of this workplace fitness stuff that's going on with standing desks and standing more often and walking to your coworkers desks instead of calling them or emailing them but in your mind there's really no comparison to taking those uh, 30 minutes 90 minutes in a gym weekly um, in terms of what you're going to see as results in, in, in your physique or or your fitness goals yeah in, in Here's the thing. Every little bit does help. It's nice to have those ideas of, of getting up and moving around. And I think there are quality things to shoot for. Um, and, and there's an interesting part of that, too, since we're talking about desk workers. Is I, I've had a couple clients move to the standing desks. And, and I think there's a need in, in, in many areas of life for understanding um, moderation and, and not doing quick changes because every single client that I had that moved to a standing desk immediately started to complain of either foot, knee, or back problems. Because, you know, the idea is, well, sitting's bad, so we should we should try and find ways to mediate that. And, and some of the issue is, well, yeah, but for a guy like me who trains all day long and I'm on my feet all day long, um, I'm really looking forward to going home and sitting. <laughs> so it, it's sort of where they're at. And so, yeah, it's I think it's good to get up and move around. But to your point, yeah, it, that can be a piece of it, but... I wouldn't look for that to be the, the solution to the problem. You're going to have to make a commitment to doing some dedicated exercise um, once you leave your desk. Does that kind of make sense? Hey, Pete, can you hear me there? Are you still there? Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, we had a little disconnect there. Um, gotcha. So someone asked a really great question, and, and okay. the question is, is um, you know, they don't have enough time to go to the gym, and they'd love okay. to, they don't have it. So is there one or two things that they could change with what they do at work that would give them a good bang for their buck? Is it standing at a desk? Is it um, walking away every hour and doing a few squats? Is it you know walking during a lunch break? Do you have something that you've kind of told your clients this really can make an impact? Oh, tough question. Um, yeah, if somebody absolutely has no time outside of their uh, their 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 job to uh, to do some fitness stuff, then yeah, I would take um, you know five, ten, fifteen minutes on lunch break or something like that, and yeah, do some walking, but. Also realize that that walking, although useful, um, isn't utilizing uh, more than a certain group of muscles. Um, so I would, yeah, if the person is capable to, um, say, do something like squats or push-ups, and, and those are, by the way, those are significant challenges. So they may have to be modified. Um, but yeah, get up, move around. Um, those are those are definitely great options. Great options, and and. Um, I, I, if possible, again, I would try and budget some time, even once a week, 15, 20 minutes. I, you know, I, I understand that people are incredibly busy. I had a client who um, worked in Mongolia, believe it or not, and so he would fly out, and he'd come back in town, and he'd be there for, basically, he'd see me one hour a week, and he'd fly back into town um, for a course of about six months. So, uh, yeah, I'd still, I'd still sort of try and hedge my bets towards getting a little bit of time in at a gym. Even if, and here's the thing, here's where I'm going with it, even if it's a short-term, go see somebody who is an expert at their job, whether it be a trainer or whatever it is, go see somebody, dedicate a little bit of time, and see if they can take a look at you and put together, okay, listen, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, 
here's what I, I would have you do for 15 minutes to get away from your desk to show you how to do a squat if you don't know how to do a squat or to show you how to do a push-up or maybe meet you where you're at, give you something to do with a group of exercises for 15 minutes and uh, then come back and see me in three months and let's switch that up. Let's see where you're at. So, yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Uh, hopefully that starts to, to direct them in the, in the right way. No, that, that's a great answer. I think that that can really help people. Um, well, I, I think this is a good follow-up question to that. So we're talking about the difference between working out at your desk or working out at work or budgeting some time to go to the gym. So how much exercise do people really need to see the desired results? It is a, that is an excellent question. And first and foremost, it kind of depends on uh, someone's goals. Like, what do you want to look like? So, you know, if you, if you again, take a look at um, – the cover model of men's health. If it's actually that person on a touch the photograph or somebody who's taking, you know, some sort of performance enhancing supplement, drug, whatever it is, um, how much time do you have to put towards that? Because uh, it just it may not be realistic. Um, so uh, to that end, I think I have, uh, the name Arthur Jones up there, and if anyone doesn't know that name, um, I think it's an interesting enough guy to talk about. He was the inventor of Nautilus fitness equipment, and he was a really intelligent guy. And, the first one I know of, which is why his name is there, first one I know of that asked the question um, sort of the way we're talking about it is he didn't want to know how much exercise somebody could tolerate. He wanted to know what is the exact amount of exercise you need um, to stimulate growth in your body and then let's be done with it. And he understood that growth doesn't happen. So your body's adaptation to exercise doesn't happen while you're in the gym. It happens while you're recovering from it. And so he had, he had sort of an interesting idea, an interesting theory, and it, it, it depends upon who it is and their goals, and it works well. But um, there's a whole group of individuals in this exercise industry, um, and, and the, the, the name of the group is it's high-intensity training, not, not what we hear of today, which is the high-intensity interval training, but high-intensity training, and his whole idea was you needed 15 to 30 minutes once a week, and it was very, very intense exercise, and then your body had to recover from it. So, you know, 30 years, 40 years later, we're still asking that question is, what does somebody need from exercise? And I think we're, the pendulum swings, I think right now what we're experiencing with the industry and, and on TV is this idea of, um, how much exercise can somebody survive? And I don't, I, I got to tell you guys this right, right at the beginning, I don't want somebody to hear what I'm saying is any of these things I'm mentioning are bad. They're not bad at all. Nothing is bad. Um, you, you need specific context to, to assess whether or not something is useful or, or less useful. But um, for example, um, somebody may choose their goal as, as doing a marathon or somebody may choose their goal as um, doing some Olympic lifting, um, sort of sort of fitness related. Um, I'm going to use the term, I shouldn't use it, but, but sort of CrossFit thing. And, and none, again, none of those things are bad. But the question is, are we trying to survive exercise? Are we trying to see how much we can get away with? Or are we trying to assess what do I need to adapt and then let me recover from it? And that sort of leads us to the idea of homeostasis, which is there's a tipping point. Um, there's a there's a point at which more stimulus, more exercise isn't useful. Um, you know, you you and there's been some research, and I, I definitely would question all of the research that you hear about or read. But there's this idea that um, in terms of your own hormone levels, after about 45 minutes of somewhat vigorous exercise, the hormones that you have that allow you to adapt favorably from exercise start to start to fall off, and the the sort of cortisol idea. Um, continues to go after 45 minutes, so there may be some level of diminishing returns. Now, I still have, I still think we should ask questions about that because there are definitely people out there who can work out for three hours straight and still see positive results, which draws into question, you know, what is exercise, what is a workout? But um, I think to answer the question of how much exercise do we really need is somewhat individual. You probably don't need to crawl out of the gym to get a good workout. In fact, many of my clients, the number one goal is when they leave, I can ask them, um, point to a body part, right, and say, okay, so we worked this today. 
do you feel like you want to do any more of that stuff? And have them go, no, it's pretty tired. But they don't need to crawl out of the gym. They just need to know that they chose something. We worked on something today. We challenged it. And then we're going to go let it recover. Um, you, this idea that you need to be, and sort of, it's sort of the sports mentality. I had it, and I still struggle with it. If you're if you're not walking funny the next day, if you're not so sore that you can't move the next day, then you didn't achieve a good workout. And, and quite frankly, nothing in our body works that way. You know, nothing requires. Um, you don't have to break a bone to have it adapt. <laughs> so we need to find what stimulus someone's able to tolerate and adapt favorably from, and return to exercise relatively relatively quickly. And hey, you know, that, uh, yeah, go ahead. Is there is there sort of a cue that if I'm going into the gym and I and I'm 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 working out and, and I'm feeling good and I feel like I'm working the muscle, is there a cue that that I should be looking out for that says, you know what, that's enough. That's that that's quite enough and you've worked them to adapt and it's time to go home and rest. Yeah, and it and this is this is <laughs> this is kind of a fun question because this is sort of um what I'm going to call, um, and I didn't make this up, I wish I did, um, the art of personal training because that's an individual thing. So, for example, if I get somebody on their first day, you know, part of part of what they're doing is they're learning the exercise. So, um, depending upon who the person is and what they're used to, I may look for what's the first set that we did where um, we achieved what looks like a perfect motion and then we get towards a little bit of shakiness at the end. I'm going to call it. I'm going to, we're going to end it. We're, we're not going to do any more of that today, and we're going to see how you feel the next day. But if I've got you for six weeks or whatever it is where I feel like I'm ready to push you, um, basically what I want to know is um, that muscle, those groups of muscles, how they're feeling. Um, if we've done a set where we're working it really hard and we come back to it, I'm going to, it's kind of a it's kind of a joke. Um, I say, do you, you know, I'll say to my client, are all your friends playing the game? So in other words, if you start to feel like, boy, this is what my, like, for example, biceps. Okay, so the the the, the show muscles, the, the guy in the picture is flexing his biceps. So if you've gotten to where you can kind of feel like, hey, look, this thing's working really well, and you go into the next set and it sort of feels like you're a little bit dead. You don't have as much stuff. There's not as many guys playing the game. Then I would say, well, yeah, it's probably the last set. Let's leave that alone. Because um, at some point, you're not getting much more out of it. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, it's it's a little bit of a bell curve, right? So yeah, you're gonna hit the top of that, and you're gonna feel a really good set, and you're gonna feel great drive and motivation, and then when you come back to that exercise, if you feel like you don't have it all there, it, it it's probably a good time to stop. Yeah, and that okay. kind of goes back to the surviving versus tolerating thing, because I I know people that that once they they say they've hit the top of that bell curve where they're feeling good. They keep going until they can't move their arm, you know, or they can't move their legs. And it's like, well, that probably is back to that idea of now you're surviving exercise, and I'm not sure you needed to do any of that. Right, right, absolutely. Um, and I know you had made a point about it not being about today; it's about long term. So, is there something that you wanted to speak to that? Yeah, yeah, and that's a tough. That that's a. I put that up there, and it's a tough thing to. Um, get people to sort of realize is, is, you know, then that goes back to motivation versus commitment because typically what happens is somebody will have um, a client of mine, that a potential client will come in and they'll have a head of doctor say, you know, by the time they get to me, look, do you need to change your life or you're going you're gonna to be looking at some physical um, health issues? And it, it's very tough because like the guy with Lance Armstrong, he, he wanted to be at the end goal tomorrow. And, and we all have that quality where, um, we're not necessarily invested in the process of getting there. We we sort of forget that it may have taken us even 10 years to look like we look now, but we want to look like that cover model tomorrow. And so we assume then, you know, back to the idea of surviving exercise, that it, look, if one hour of exercise, the government tells us one hour of exercise is good, so if one hour is good, I'll get there faster if I do three. And that's not that's not really the case. And so the idea is, Look, I, it's good to have some short-term goals, but my commitment is going to be long-term. I, I may not look like I want to look in three weeks, but I'm not going to let that get me down. I'm going to stick to my plan, and I'm, I'm going to shoot for a year out. And after that, I'm going to plan for another year out. So the idea of investments that pay dividends, 
get cut yourself some slack know that you're making a long-term investment and start trying to do the things um, that will change your body long term and, and that typically ends up being a blend of um, don't necessarily and this 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 is tough don't necessarily focus on the exercise um, exercise stuff that we're typically sold burns calories calorie burning is an important piece of it but to get to where you want you might need to do some exercise stuff that focuses maybe more on um, gaining some muscle okay um, and, and the reason for that is then you start to sort of change the way you look and it becomes a, a bigger payoff but it doesn't happen right away um, you know so hedging your bets in, tar in terms of in terms of blending both the quote-unquote cardio stuff with the strength training stuff I think too many people get caught up in I want to lose weight so I'm gonna go jump in the treadmill for an hour and that's fine that's okay but um, you know let's take a look at that stuff that you're using on the treadmill the hips the knees everything let's strengthen those muscles um, so that when you're on a treadmill you get a little bit more out of it that kind of makes sense. Uh, so that that's the investment that pays dividends. That's an awesome answer. Yeah, that's exactly that's exactly what um, I was hoping to get. So, uh, well, I, I included this slide because I'm really curious. So we, we're calling this part of the webinar "Words with the Trainer." So, gotcha. what's been the most eye-opening experiences when training every you know everyday people? Um. So. I think one of the reasons I, I mean, I've always been passionate about learning and, and sort of um, advancing as much as I can in this field. And one of the things that was actually driving me was um, I was frustrated with not being able to help people. Um, you know, I, I was sort of spinning my wheels. And so my goal is to go out there and get more um, certifications and, and more information. And I think the reality started to hit where, um, I can't remember who it was or where it came from, but there's a sort of a, uh, a synopsis of a quote it's um, you know we leave school and we're frustrated with the people that we can't help and so we go out and we try and find more information and better information and it may not be the information but it's how we put it together at what point in time and so there was a big shift in my perspective um, and I'll give credit directly to the program here the, the resistance training specialist program it was a big shift in my perspective um, when somebody sort of asked me like well why are you as an exercise professional learning about exercise like a consumer and I sort of looked at him funny I'm like well what do you mean he said well you're becoming an exercise professional by learning more exercises and the, the question he posed to me is how can you um, learn about exercise if you don't even know it goes into one and, and that's that's sort of the reality that we have and it's totally fine if you're a consumer um, to sort of take a look at men's health and look at a bunch of you know really interesting exercises. You know, there's the um, and it's by no means am I picking on men's health. It's a it's a cool magazine, but um, you can buy the and I'll pick on Arnold Schwarzenegger here. You know, there's Arnold's book of a thousand and one exercises or whatever. Um, and we've typically in our industry done that by okay. So if I know 500 exercises. I'm a, a you know intermediate, and if I learn a thousand, I'm an expert. And the the reality is, when you step back and you start to learn, well, what is it that actually makes up an exercise? What do I know about the human body in terms of um, not only muscular function but also joint function? What do these joints offer? And then, more specifically, what does it look like under the skin? What do these what do these bones look like? What, what are the ligaments? All all that stuff what makes up the body and then even more specific how is that different from person to person in, in, in significant ways and then with that what are the other pieces that, that form an exercise okay so um, things like time um, you know tempo of the of the exercise and the most important thing I think that we really really miss as a profession is um, the understanding of mechanics and resistance um, you know the interesting thing is what makes up a progression for somebody in terms of challenging their body um, doesn't involve learning different exercises it actually involves learning more about um, that specific tissue those joints that you're challenging and how are you manipulating the resistance to accommodate what the person has and you know you give those exercises different names 
um, or you can forget names and just sort of learn how to modify the mechanics. What does this person have today? So, you know, for a squat, for example, um, you know, somebody out there will say, well, you have to squat till your butt touches the ground. Well, i got to be honest with you, that sort of depends on someone's hip structure, um, how they distribute their mass. So, in other words, um, you know, if, if somebody has a lot of, um, you know, <clears throat> mass or, or weight in their hips and their hips are going back, well, that determines how they're going to fold up in space. Um, do they have the hip structure ability to even get that low? When you start to peel that back and look at all the pieces, there's really not a thing called an exercise, but there's a bunch of variables that when they get put together, blended together, we give a name. And that's a tough perspective because I think the reality is, and the problem is, when we, when we learn um, about exercise by memorizing exercises, they each come with their own little prepackaged rules. You know, and here's one that almost everyone has heard. When you're doing a barbell um, bench press, the bar has to touch your chest. Why? Why would the bar ever have to touch my chest? What does that have to do with anything? Well, you have to go full range. Full range for what? Because when I bring my arms up for the, for the press, my arms are nowhere near the end of the range for anything. You know, so that range that's arbitrarily determined was actually made up for a sport called powerlifting and kept alive by um, the need to conduct research and have standardized protocols. The bar touching your chest in a bench press has absolutely nothing to do with whether or not it's healthy for your shoulder or within your tolerance. So that's sort of what that, that idea is, is a real shift in perspective for starting to look at the individual and going, well, what do they currently have available to them at, at um, this body, this joint, this whatever it is I'm trying to challenge, and how do I piece together an exercise or the mechanics to challenge that appropriately? Um, and I know that's I know that's an abstract, difficult thing. It probably took me, you know, three or four years to really get to a, dif uh, a definitive understanding of what that means. But it was a big, big deal for me, and and it really led to me being able to help people that I never had any business dealing with um, initially. Um, and so that was a huge, huge shift in perspective for me. Man, that's that's awesome. It's uh... It's an interesting perspective to switch from looking at exercises to looking at how the body actually uses itself and and and, and goes through gravity and, and it's a uh, it's a whole different outlook. But I, I will say a question came in, Pete, and mm -hmm. they they were really interested in your last point. And, and what they're asking is, what do you tell someone that doesn't feel accomplished when they don't leave the gym sore? How do you how do you back it up that they that they don't need to necessarily feel sore? Is is there some level of comfort that you can give them to let them know that not every good workout requires just beating yourself up and being totally sore? Yeah, um, that's that's sort of a it's a difficult question to answer because typically I'll, I'll be honest with you, and I've had those um, I've had those for clients, um, and I sort of smile at them a little bit and I, I chuckle because um, I, I asked them I said. You know, you came to me, uh, and I know this is difficult for the webinar, but I said, you, you came to me and you're trusting me as a professional. Give me six weeks, and, uh, and I'll answer that question for you. And, and then what ends up happening is I make sure that I'm not going to hurt them first. And I, and I try and assess where their tolerance is, and then I'll get them to a point with an exercise. You know, pick anyone you want, and I'll make them, and here's an interesting thing. This goes back to the learning exercises be you know, by doing more rather than learning about an exercise. And I'll say it's not good enough for you just to count to 10 while you do it. I want you to own every inch of this exercise, meaning I want you focused, your brain and also your body on using this specific set of muscles for every drop of motion of this exercise. And we get to a point where we're challenging them. And I'll answer the question by looking at them while they're doing the exercise and I'll say, do you want to do one more? And the answer is always no, because it's incredibly exhausting. And, and the reality is that kind of goes back to we want to put more effort into more stuff rather than more effort into the actual exercise. So we make the assumption that doing more and being tired was the goal versus don't, don't focus on doing more. Focus on the quality of what you're doing, because if you do that, and you really put effort into 
let's say, you know, whatever exercise it is that you're doing, you're doing pull-ups, okay? And instead of throwing your body up there for three more, focus on really doing two more perfectly. Get a squeeze at the top, control every inch. You won't be able to do a third. You know, so that's typically how I go about answering that question is, let me show you what it's like to own every inch of an exercise, and you won't want to do another one. Man, that's an awesome answer. Um, well, for the for the sake of time, I think we're just gonna um, open up the, uh, the the call for questions. So, if any of you guys have questions, go ahead and start typing them in now, and we'll do a Q and A session. And so, while you guys are typing that in, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about us at Wellright. Um, we're a corporate wellness platform that allows you to take your existing program and then leverage all of our technology. And if you do not have, currently have an existing program in place, we also provide a turnkey wellness program complete with challenges. We have a health risk assessment, personal wellness feedback, tracker integration, and biometric screening. And the best part of our software is it's completely customizable to fit the needs of your company. So that's just a little bit of an overview of kind of what we do. Um, and, and one question has come in. Okay. And that question is, is if you have a client who's coming from working in a desk all day, and I know you get this question a lot, but are free weights better than machines? Oh man, tough question. Um, I'll try and keep this short. And, and here's the thing: um, just a little background on the, on the answer to this because I think it's important. Um, all throughout my career as a trainer, both through playing sports and college, I had, I had learned that um, machines were a waste of time. Okay and that they weren't as effective as free weights. And um, so that's, that's how I started my career as a trainer up until about five years ago um, when I actually started to, to, to be educated on what a machine offers you. Okay, somebody will say, well, you sit all day, so don't go sit on the machine. And these are, these are half-truths. They're, they're sort of um, superficial answers. And the reality is that the machine will offer you at times, okay, and this is tough because it depends on, on the tool, um, and by the way, and this is just a sidebar piece of information, but you know, I, I'm going to use a machine that everyone bashes, but let's say it's a leg extension and everyone, you know, people don't like leg extensions, but forget they may not like it, just for this example. Every single equipment company and different lines between every single equipment company um, will have a different cam set up on their leg extension. So no leg extension is the same. Okay, so if you hear somebody go, well, leg extensions are bad, immediately what should go off in your head is, okay, but which one? Because they're all different. I mean, every single one of them is different, and that's what makes it kind of cool. Um, the leg extension, for example, may offer you a different challenge, a different stimulus the squat won't give you. And it's debatable as to whether or not that matters for a given person. Um, but, for example, if you're doing a squat, Okay, your challenge, your greatest challenge, unless you found some way to make the resistance lighter, which is possible and it's a really cool thing to do, um, your greatest challenge in the squat is going to be at the lower position, the bottom position. And, and you kind of understand it because standing straight up, your legs don't have to do a whole lot of work. But if you were to lower yourself down just below, just, just right above where you're going to touch your chair when you sit at work and just pause there and hang out, that's a pretty tough place to hang out. So your resistance is going to be the greatest at the bottom of the squat and really quite easy at the top of the squat, which means that the front of your leg, the thigh, for example, doesn't have to do any work there. But you go ahead and sit down and use a leg extension machine, and now you go ahead and, and complete that motion. Well, in that same position where in a squat you have no resistance, now in a leg extension you do have resistance. Uh, another great example of that is performing a row. Uh, mechanically speaking, if you're doing a free weight or a dumbbell row, um, you're going to have the ability to have more weight where your arm is straight and as you go through the range of motion to having your elbow by your side, you're going to need less weight due to simple mechanics of your arm. Nothing you can do to change it. Okay, Your, your arm length isn't going to change through the exercise. It's just the way it is. What that means is when you do your dumbbell row, you have to make a decision. Do you want to choose the weight that you could use for the first third of the range, the second third of the range, or the, or the final, the, the last third of the range? And the answer is always going to be you pick the weight that you can handle at the end, which means you may be leaving some, some weight off of what you could do. 
Now, if you chose to use a machine, um, that machine may potentially, again, depending upon which brand and which manufacturer, offer you a resistance that gives you more at the beginning of the row and starts to get lighter as you finish the row. Um, and that was, you know, one of Arthur Jones, the guy who invented Nautilus, is one of his main ideas is, can I make exercise more efficient by taking um, the place in the range of motion where you're the strongest and giving you more resistance and the place in the range of motion where you're weakest and giving you less resistance? And it's a really, really cool idea, and it's a really um, valuable tool. So the answer to the question ultimately depends on who you are and where you're at and what your goals are. Okay, so I think machines are incredibly valuable. But if I didn't have one, I would still have no problem training the individual with just free weights. So that's the tough answer to that question. They are valuable, valuable tools, but like any tool, it can be used improperly, and it can be used for the wrong reasons, and it can be um, utterly worthless or completely um, useful and valuable. Well, Pete, I think I'm going to steal that answer uh, because I, I've been asked that a lot, and that's about the best explanation I've heard. Um, and I hope everyone on the call has has gotten something out of uh, our webinar today. And once again, Pete, I wanted to thank you for coming on uh, the webinar today. If there's anyone out there who who lives near Madison, Wisconsin, out where Pete is, um, we put his email up there, PeteLeeBrown at gmail.com. I'm sure he'd love to field any questions that you have or look into training. Um, but Pete, thanks again. You were wonderful, and thank you everyone for coming out to our webinar today. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for having me, and thank you, everyone, for taking the time to listen. All right, everyone. We look forward to uh, you joining us on the next webinar. Have a great day.